Um, so next up we have Pippa Jarvis. Every child has the right to grow up in a loving and responsible family. This is the vision of the TLC Children's Home, a family-run organization founded in 1993 as a not-for-profit child and youth care center. Pippa Jarvis has worked in the home for 27 years and became the managing director in 2015. She holds a degree in education and has committed herself to ensuring that the children in her care are placed in permanent and responsible families. Wow, it's an honor to be here and, uh, and I've, it's kind of weird because I feel a little redundant because what Debbie has said and what our esteemed colleague over there has mentioned are all exactly what I'm going to talk about. But that is that at the end of the day, we need you to do this. Whoa, how does this work? I'm so sorry, can you, uh, my eyes are so... <laughs> okay. No, but I want that one. Here we go. I need you to do this, please, just do this. If you do anything else, just do this. <laughs> Has anyone ever heard of aesthetic force? Aesthetic force? No, okay. I'm sure some of you might have heard of it, but if you haven't, I bet that you can recall a time when you've experienced it. In fact, you just experienced it a minute ago. A stunning artwork that keeps you coming back to see it. A musical rendition that gets you dancing or brings you to tears. That's aesthetic force. A simple definition would be to describe it as how a picture a story, or <clears throat> some other creative work exerts power to move you to act. Unfortunately, I'm no musician and I'm no artist, but I do see powerful things every day in reality that we are doing as human beings and it requires us to act. And so I'm hoping here to use my words and the words of others more eloquent than I to exert a similar kind of force on you. In your profession, I'm sure you're keenly aware of how important words are when we use them how we use them, the ones we choose to use or not use despite the pressure, it all matters. Every great speech, every historic call to arms, every long recited poem, they exist because the words stir in us our greatness as human beings. They bring us to mind all the things that are possible and they shine a light on just how beautiful real life can be. Now, I don't know how many of you actually did the pre-reading. So when I, when I got the brief to write something for your pre-reading, I didn't know it was going to be 300 pages. So <laughs> I didn't write 300 pages. But I'd be surprised if anybody did their homework that I said for you. Did anybody do your homework? Anybody? No? I didn't think so. So I'm going to bring you all up to speed. Oh, sorry. So that's to cue you. <laughs> Among the most accomplished and fabled tribes of Africa, no tribe was considered to have warriors more fearsome or more intelligent than the mighty Maasai. It is perhaps surprising then to learn the traditional greeting that passed between Maasai warriors and how are the children. It is still the traditional greeting among the Maasai, acknowledging the high value that the Maasai always place on their children's well-being. Even warriors with no children of their own would always give the traditional answer, all the children are well. Meaning, of course, that peace and safety prevail, that the priorities of protecting the young are in place, that Messiah society has not forgotten its reason for being, its proper functions and responsibilities. <laughs> all the children are well means that life is good. It means that the daily struggles for existence do not preclude proper caring for their young. Hmm. I wonder how it might affect our consciousness of our own children's welfare if in our culture we took to greeting each other with this daily question, and how are the children? I wonder if we heard that question and passed it along to each other a dozen times a day if it would begin to make a difference in the reality of how the children are thought of or cared about in our own country. I wonder if every adult among us, parent and non-parent alike, felt an equal weight for the daily care and protection of all children in our communities, in our towns, in our states, and in our country. And I wonder if we could truly say without hesitation, the children are well Yes, all the children are well.
all the children. So I was struck this morning in listening to the presentations, and you'll forgive me for digressing from my type notes for a moment, just about the voices. So there are some children who are unfortunate that their families are being separated by divorce and the tragedy of that. And yet they have a voice. They have someone who will advocate for them. They have someone who will stand in the gap. But what about those that have no voice? And that's the ones that I'm here for and the ones that Debbie is here for. They are the ones that don't have somebody standing and, and championing for them with a megaphone and, and, and making plans for their future and having a long-term view because they are just forgotten in the background and, and they're supposedly in care, but they are the most uncared for in our society. Um, Esna said, divorce is a legal and so psychosocial phenomenon. So is institutionalization. It is also a legal and psychosocial phenomenon, and it is very, very, very damaging to those children and to the society in which we live. And if we hope to build a better society, we better start fixing the problems that are happening here. So, back to my notes. <clears throat> the day that humanity cl collectively prioritizes the well-being of all our babies is a day that I long for, but it is not today. Today, the children in our country are in a crisis with some of the most vulnerable being those in our residential care system. For too long, their welfare has been entrusted to those who have no heart for it. Those at the highest level, charged with the well-being of our nation's most vulnerable, have become hollow men. Their hearts carved away by bureaucracy, their passion eroded by politics, and their hope extinguished by a system that punishes as a betrayal of professionalism the emotional connection between human beings. In a world where we can do so much, it is devastating to see how little we choose to do. Environmental conservation applies a systemic approach to solutions for saving our environmental world. No longer are people investing in siloed, one-dimensional solutions. And we need to do this. We need to be as committed to applying the same kind of holistic focus on establishing a sustainable social ecosystem. In the same way our battle to save the planet is, just, is at a critical juncture, so too are we fast approaching a turning point to save our society from social disaster. We need to do something and we need to do it fast. Our country's over 50% youth unemployment rate and the phenomenal recording of over 23,000 teenaged pregnancies in South Africa in the first 12 months of COVID tells us that we are going terribly wrong and our future is more precarious than ever. But what can be done? Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. The truth of the matter is that we can all make an impact. As individuals, we don't have to save the world, but we must do our part in shaping it. It is an observable fact that in our country, our babies have no safe spaces. From the time they are conceived, they are in a fight for their survival. As toddlers, they have no assurance that someone will protect them. As children, they learn that the system does not love them. And as young people, they lift their eyes to the table, only to find there is no welcome for them there. The last line of defense sits in this room. I'm sorry, but it sits in this room. People, you, good people, who have chosen to fight the good fight, to stand for those who cannot stand for themselves, to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, a band of warriors no less awe-inspiring than those mighty Maasai who keep their spears at the ready to defend the defenseless. And who are we defending them from? The absurdity does not escape me. We are stuck fighting those who are supposed to be on our own team, those responsible to fulfill the intentions of the very system we created to safeguard our babies. The precept of the best interests of the child is clearly laid out in many guidelines to our constitution. It's pretty much universally accepted that this determination should be made with the mindful intent to secure a durable solution for each individual child. It's beautiful, a durable solution for each individual child. But tragically, those words have become just another catchphrase, and we see the system failing to recognize the individual need for rapid, responsible intervention. And instead, it holds them hostage and separated from the community that should be supported to embrace them. Our last weapon against the gross injustices being meted out against our babies is our legal system. This child is a gift, and so we will call him such. Gift. Was born to a South African but unregistered mother. Even though she wanted to do the right thing when he was born, 
and signed consent for him to have a new family. She had no ID, and the magistrate would not allow her to sign. There's no alternative strategy for mothers, <clears throat> excuse me, who wish, sorry, that's gonna be croaky, one second. <clears throat> Thank you. There's no alternative strategy for mothers who wish to relinquish their infants if they fall outside of the home affairs system. Their only option is abandonment. Though it's possible, there is no DNA option to help them prove that they are the mothers. There's no sworn affidavit that'll suffice for their adoption to be consented. Gift's mother couldn't safely give him up, and she couldn't keep him. So Gift was institutionalized at four months old, relinquished to a system that, as set out in our Constitution, would be responsible to care for and safeguard his future, always acting in his best interests. Ha ha. Sadly for Gift and for so many other beautiful gifts in our country, because his mother had no ID, the issuing of Gift's own birth certificate became to date an insurmountable obst obstacle. His mother did her best to try to get her ID, but it was a long, humiliating, expensive and frustrating endeavor and eventually his mother gave up and she abandoned her son to the system. Gift has just turned six and he's been with us for six years. Only this year, <clears throat> and because we as a children's home were able to find a passionate, persistent lawyer to rattle some cages, is he expecting to receive his birth certificate, ideally shortly, but who knows? And by now, his prospects for a loving family are lower than low. So that's something people don't recognize, is that there are several barriers to being placed into permanent care for a child, permanent family care. But the biggest one is the length of stay that you spend in the system. For every day that you spend in an institution, you can count your options and opportunities for family placement lower and lower and lower on the scale. The older they are, the more likely children are to be perceived as damaged by the system, and the far less likely they are ever to find a family willing to commit to them for the long haul. Because institutionalized children are special needs children. They need special care. They need additional therapies. They need additional support. Often they need specialized education. All of that places a huge burden on adoptive families or even families when the children are reunified. So the faster we can do it, the more we can equip people to be better parents and have ultimately children who are able to enter our society as productive human beings. Children in care are being injured every day. Their hopes for a bright future shaved away by those entrusted with precious gifts like these. Though our beautiful constitution recognizes that families are best for babies, for one reason or another, our systems don't provide the follow through for family placement to be the outcome. Fragmentation of the regulatory processes and petty politically minded role players operating in silos result in ineffective service delivery, contextually inappropriate placement decisions, and increased expenses for everyone. We need early intervention on cases and we need to work within an integrated and holistic system. I want to introduce you to somebody, but she's a ghost, so I made her look like a ghost. Have you heard the term ghost children? These are little ones who exist physically, but not in any other way, not on paper. They are the ones who are most vulnerable to trafficking, to exploitation, to abuse. All the things we're supposed to be stopping with our beautiful constitution are now being forced upon these children. So we call her Lettuce. In the care system, the number of these ghost children is growing and it is terrifying. Lettuce is, of course, not her real name, but technically she doesn't have a name. So that's a nickname that we, we use. Just, there's a story behind it, but I won't waste your time with that. But for almost all intents and purposes, she doesn't exist. If she disappeared today, there would be no proof that she was ever a person at all, other than these photographs. Have you noticed how in most places in South Africa, what should happen and what actually happens is never the same thing? And how politicians, especially now in the run-up to elections, they'll insist they know how to make the right thing happen if we just give them a chance. Well, I promise you, I will vote for, I will rally, I will punt and I will promote for anyone who can find a way to start a revolution for babies like lettuce. On the 20th of December, 2020, in the midst of our lockdown and right before Christmas, a young woman presents herself in the last stages of labor to her local MOU. Do you know what an MOU is? It stands for Maternal Outpatients Unit. It's a specialized government clinic, a day clinic, 
where expectant mothers can attend prenatal checkups and come and deliver their babies when the time comes. It sounds pretty good, right? Like, quite civilized. Well, how things are and how they should be are not the same thing. Lettuce's mommy was underage. She was smart enough, though, to make healthy prenatal choices, and she diligently attended her checkups, despite attending under the harsh, judgmental gaze of nurses who felt that it was her, their right every time she came to remind them of what a naughty girl she was and how she should have known better. She had chosen not to abort, but boy, did she have to fight with that alternative, forcing her young little voice above the crowing to insist to the social worker there that she really did want to consent for her baby to be adopted and keep it within a family home but she could not keep it with her family because it would jeopardize her baby's life and her own life because the family could never know that this baby was conceived through a violation from one of their own. And so on that festive December evening, just four hours after delivering a healthy baby, Lettice's mommy expects to hand over her child to caring hands and be discharged. The only thing is, most social workers are on leave from the 16th of December. So there were no willing hands to take that baby. And oh, did I mention that MOUs have no facility to care for babies without their mommies? They have no system in place for when babies and mommies are separated. No system at all. Which is kind of smart, because then they can't be left literally holding the baby. So what do they do? The nurses, they try by force to make the mommy take the baby with her. And in desperation, the mommy searches through her medical file and discovers some kind of proof that she had been counseled to relinquish her child and that... With that, she hands it over, hops out the door as quickly as her recently dislocated body allows, and disappears into the night. The nurses, though, are not going to sit with this problem. And so within four hours of her birth, they had handed over lettuce to TLC, and we had brought her safely home. But she had no proof of, proof of birth paperwork. The MOU had no printed forms to fill out. They had no documentation to give us to prove that she was born. So we had them write something on a little piece of paper, and in the hopes that we could go back and petition for it at a later date when they did get some printed papers. But you know, so, so, uh, children's homes are not statutory bodies. They don't have any statutory powers, and the DSD loves to use this as the reason why we cannot do anything. As you mentioned before, we are not allowed to have any interaction around casework at all. So this would have been a casework issue. So if we hadn't broken the policy and gone to the MOU ourselves later to fetch the, the proof of birth, she still wouldn't have one, because DSD aren't going to do that. I know they aren't. Her Form 4, which is the order that's supposed to be lodged in court, within 48 hours, which is prescribed by the law, 48 hours of child, of child coming into care or being separated from its parents, well, we couldn't do that either, and oh yes, the social worker was on leave. So what actually happens and what should happen? For lettuce, it meant waiting four months for a DSD social worker to be allocated her case, only to find that that social worker was not motivated, equipped, or otherwise empowered to do the legwork. Thankfully, as I mentioned, we had risked the ire of the powers that be and actually gone to fight for her proof of birth and managed to get that ourselves. But it's not a birth certificate. It turns out that, like Gift, Lettuce's mother also had never applied for an ID, because remember, she was underage. And so her consent was worthless. Abandonment was the only option to her because she couldn't take the baby home. And Lettuce will forever have a hole where she could have had some comfort in knowing that her mother had tried to make the responsible choice. So no mother, no name, no legal placement records. What's to stop me, as a children's home or as a caregiver, finding some other desperate or wealthy person who would be interested in a child that is as beautiful as this? We could do an off-the-books exchange and nobody would be the wiser. And it terrifies me. She's a ghost. It doesn't take much imagination to think of the horrors that would be meted out on a vulnerable child like this. Assuming that she even survived to adulthood, though, she would be in no position to take her place in our society. Our society! When we are 90 years old, we're going to need a caregiver who is 40 or 50. What use is she going to be to you if all we've ever done is leave her behind in the dust? So I can rattle off big problems, like overwrought, poorly trained, dispassionate social workers who delay, postpone, shirk, and obstruct opportunities for permanent placements. Or I can tell you about government officials who use the system to avoid accountability and who bow to political sentiment to avoid making decisions. And I'm sorry to say, I, 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 I'm familiar that you are the only sort of actual judge in the room, but perhaps I'm wrong. But uh, forgive me, but the magistrates need to grow some. Like, they really need to get some courage. Um, 
it's not okay that as the, they are the warriors standing at the gate and they have no courage. It's like they've just turned into wobbly men and it's not okay. I can't leave a baby like this in the hands of someone I can't trust and I'm sorry, but if I go to children's court and I've got a magistrate who is afraid to make a decision, then I can't trust you to act in that child's best interest and that's not okay. Sorry, okay, that was again off the notes. I do that, which is why I make the notes. All right. <clears throat> What I'd rather do is quickly tell you how you can make a difference, how you can be a warrior for a gift or a lettuce. And I, I'm so excited because I actually heard some murmurings around that before with Debbie's, Debbie's um, presentation. So I can't do it. I'm trying every day. I sit there and I rattle those bars, but our children are still sitting in cages and I can't do it without your help. And I've noticed that we can wield some significant influence if we use the legal baton. And so please, in the words of another famous great warrior, please help us to bend the system towards justice. In a system that is so unwieldy and disjointed, children are disappearing into the chasms that exist in our various government services. And we need you to be outraged, outraged by that. We need you to look at the, vo at the, to look at the system and be the voice and says, look at this pattern. It is supremely unjust that after 131 Cases of getting birth certificates ordered by court, they still don't have them in their hands. They should have had them the next day because it was already an injustice. Now we're just putting injustice over injustice. Okay, sorry, back to the notes. I need you to be outraged. We understand that a broken system is no one person's fault entirely, but we also have to recognize that the system is made up of individual parts. And if we don't hold those individual parts accountable, we might as well just let the system clog up and hold us all hostage forever and ever. We've got to go, and we've got to hold them accountable for their inefficiencies and their lack of determination, and we've got to find a way to strengthen the weaknesses that exist in our system. When we can once again hold, once again hold the powerful accountable for the, how they wield their power, then our children may have a future that they can look forward to. So, my challenge to you. Just pick one child in care as we were, uh, were encouraged to do. Make yourself known to child protection organizations or children's homes in your area. Make yourself available for one child. Insert yourself into their story. I promise, it's heartbreaking, but it is so worth it. Invite yourself into their story. Follow their casework from the start. Advocate for them when decisions are being made for them. Champion for them when delays are being, uh, becoming normal. And if needed, go to war for them so that they don't have to spend one unnecessary day in institutional care. I explained in the pre-reading, which now you all have to go and read afterwards because I worked really hard on it. <laughs> Your role would be to write a stern note, wave the proverbial legal baton, or otherwise advise us on how to unstick the stuck. A few examples of what we mean, and I know you've heard a few of them already, but we found that log jams in case progress can be shifted just by having that authoritative correspondence with a caseworker to add that little bit of pressure when delays are un unnecessary. It may be in just reminding them to follow through on court instructions such as applying for birth certificates. The gift's birth certificate was ordered twice in the magistrate's court. We had two court orders and we're still sitting without the birth certificate. It's not okay. Somebody should be hauled in there by their socks and held accountable. It's not okay. So add your weight to the appeal for placement investigations to be done promptly. It helps us maybe if you can wade through messy citizenship issues or even this undocumented mother thing. So there's this idea in DSD that South Africans don't abandon their children and that it's done by foreigners only, which then leads DSD to allow cases to be given to, like given this flavor that somehow these children don't belong to South Africa, that they are foreign children. But then, do you know the complexity is trying to go to some kind of a foreign embassy and Ask them to claim the child so that it can be made available for adoption. But how do I prove to the Zimbabwean embassy that this child is Zimbabwean or Mozambican or from Ghana or from Kenya or from Malawi? There is no way. South Africa has to take responsibility because these children are going to be ours whether we like it or not. If they are in a children's home now and they are raised in a children's home until they are 18, they are going to end up in the care system, the prison system or the mental health system because we cannot expect them to be functioning adults unless we invest in them when they are babies. Sorry, enough preaching. Our babies deserve better. They cannot be left to suffer systemic indignity, and so I have pledged to fight, and I ask you to fight with me.
Thank you very much. And Debbie is my sister in arms, so definitely that is a big shout out to Debbie as well. We couldn't do this work if we didn't collaborate. And that's really been the lesson for us in all these years, is we cannot do it as individuals. We have to fight a system with a system and use our power together collectively. Sorry, I talk too much on it. Thank you very much. And please read that book. I know I, d I don't like to like, give you more homework, but that book, every human being on the world, in the world should read that book. It talks about how we are shaped by early childhood experiences, and it is so powerful. It'll help you. Sorry. Oh. It's called what happened, what happened to You, and it's by Dr. Bruce Perry, who's a, a neurosequential uh, psychologist who's dealt with trauma. But he doesn't just deal with trauma, he talks about how your personality, who you are sitting here in this room, is shaped by your infancy. And it's so powerful because it's so practical and relatable and it's not le like scientific, it's really, really practical. And if you understood that, you would know why it's so important for your children, your grandchildren, yourself, the person next to you, the person who drives your bus. It's so important to understand where we all came from and that we are all in this together. I'll stop now. I'll step away, then I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.